So how do you construct a computational template from which uh, a certain kind of thing emerges? So, so how can you predict what emerges, I suppose? So if you can predict it, it doesn't count as emergence. Actually, <laughs> I think... <laughs> That's a deeply poetic line. We can talk about uh, it. I mean, it's a bit like it's if you measure it, it doesn't count. Um, that's right, right. <laughs> Speaking of emergence and empowerment, because we're constantly uh, uh, um, moving between those as if they're equals in the, on the team. And one of them, Christoph, shared with me a mathematical equation for what does it mean to empower nature and what does empowerment in nature look like. Mm -hmm. um, and that relates to emergence, and we can go back to emergence in a few moments. But I, I want to, I want to say it so that I know that I've learned it. <laughs> <laughs> and if I've well, learned it, I can use it later. Yeah, um, and maybe you'll figure something out as you say it. Of course, also, of course, Christoph <laughs> is the master here. But, the but really, um, we were thinking again: what does nature want? Nature wants. Um, nature wants uh, to increase the information dimension and reduce entropy. Um, what do we want? We kind of want the same thing. We want more, but um, we want order, right? And this goes back to your conversation with Yosha about stochastic versus deterministic languages or processes. His definition or the definition he found um, was that an agent is empowered if the entropy of the distribution of all of its states is high, while the entropy of the distribution of a single state given a choice, given a, an action, is low. Meaning it's that kind of uh, um, yeah, duality between opportunity, like starting like this and going like this, opening and closing. And, and, and this really, I think, is analogous to, to human empowerment. Mm -hmm. Given an mm -hmm. uh, infinite wide array of choices, what is the choice that you make? Uh, to, you know, to 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 enable, to empower, uh, to provide you with with the agency that you need. And how much does that making that choice actually control the the trajectory of the system? That's really nice. So this this applies to all the kinds of systems you're talking about. Yeah, and the cool thing is it it can apply to a human on an individual basis, but or a silkworm or a bee um, or a microbe, um, a microbe that has agency or by virtue of, 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 of a template. Um, but it also applies to a community of, of organisms like the bees. Um, and so we've done a lot of work sort of moving from, you've asked how to grow things. So we've grown things uh, using um, co-fabrication where we're digitally fabricating with other organisms that live across the various kingdoms of life. And, and those were silkworms and bees. And, uh, and with bees, um, which we've sent to outer space and returned healthily, and they were reprodu reproductive. Okay, you're gonna have to tell that story. <laughs> you're gonna have to t talk about the robotic queen and the pheromones. Come on. Like, um, so right. we built what we called a synthetic apiary, and the synthetic apiary was designed uh, as an environment that was a perpetual spring environment for the bees of Massachusetts. They go in hibernation, of course, during the winter season, um, and then we lose 80% of them or more uh, during that period. We we're thinking, okay, what if we created this environment where um, before you template, right, before you can design with, you have to de design for, right? You have to create this space of mutualism, space of sort of shared connection between you and the organism. And with bees, it started as the synthetic apiary. And we have proven that that curated environment where we design the space with high levels of control of temperature, humidity, and light, and we've proven that they were um, reproductive and alive. And we realized, wow, this environment that we created uh, can help augment bees in the winter season in any city around the world uh, where, where bees survive and thrive in the summer and spring seasons? And could this be a kind of a new urban typology, an architectural typology of symbiosis, of mutualism between organisms and humans? Where these, or by the way, the synthetic API was in a co-op in, you know, nearby Somerville. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, you know, we had robots. Our team, you know, schlepped there every day with our 
with our tools and machines and, and we made it happen. And the neighbors were very happy and, and they got to get a ton of honey at the end of the winter. And, and those bees, of course, were released into the wild at, at the end of the winter, alive and kicking. So then in order to actually experiment with, with the robotic queen and idea or concept, yeah. uh, we had to prove obviously that we can create this space for, uh, for bees. And then after that, we had this amazing opportunity to send the bees to space on Blue Shepherd mission that is part of Blue Origin. And we of course said, yes, we'll take a slot. We said, okay, can we outdo NASA? So NASA in 1982 had an experiment where they sent bee, bees to, to outer space. Uh, the bees returned, they were not reproductive. And, um, and some of them died. And, and we thought, well, is there a way in which we can create a life support system, almost like a small mini biolab of a queen and her retinue mm -hmm. um, that would be sent in this uh, Blue Origin New Shepherd mission? Uh, in this one cell. And, and so that if the synthetic apiary was an architectural project, in this case, this second synthetic apiary was a product. It was, right, so from an, from an architectural controlled environment to a product scale control environment. And this bio lab, uh, this life support system for bees, was designed to provide the bees with all the conditions that they needed. And, and we looked at that time at the Nasanov pheromone that the queen uses to guide the other bees. And we looked uh, at uh, pheromones that are associated with a bee and thinking of those pheromones being released inside the capsules that go, the capsule that goes to outer space. They returned um, back to our, the Media Lab roof and those bees were alive and kicking and reproductive. Uh, and, you know, and they continued to create comb and, and, it ended with a beautiful nature paper that the team and I published together. We gave them gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles because we were interested if, if bees recycle wax. It was known forever that bees do not recycle the wax. And by feeding them these gold nanoparticles, we were able to prove that, um, that the bees actually do recycle the wax. The reason I'm bringing this forward is because we don't view ourselves as designers of consumable products and, and, and architectural environments only, but we love that moment where these technologies, and by the way, every one of these projects that we created um, involved the creation of a new technology, whether it be a glass printer or the spinning robot or, or the um, life support system for, for the bee colony, they all involved a technology that was associated with the, the, the project. And I never, ever, ever, ever want to let that part go because I love, love technology so much. Um, and, but, but also another element of this is that always these projects, if they're great, they reveal new knowledge about, or new science about um, the topic that, that you're investigating, be it, mm. you know, uh, silkworms or or bees or or glass. That's why I say I always tell my team it should be at MoMA and the cover of Nature or Science at the same time. We don't separate between the art and the science. It's 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 one of the same.